Well, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, please turn back to the book of Romans. We have been going through Paul's letter to the church at Rome for a number of Sundays now. We began in chapter 1, verse 1, we've slowly been working our way down verse by verse, and uh, this morning we find ourselves beginning in chapter 1, verse 18, and Lord willing, we'll make it to chapter, uh, pardon me, verse 23. So if you have found it, I ask that you would please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18, hear with me the very words of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is the reading of the word of God. May it be believed and treasured as such. You may be seated. Let us go to the Lord as we seek to hear and understand his word. God, we humble ourselves before you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who rules over all things, the one who made all things, the one who sustains all things, the one who is the goal of all things. And you are speaking by your written words. Your word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can pierce and cut to the innermost parts of our very beings. And we do believe what you've said about your word, that it is without error, that it is true, absolutely without any admixture of error. And so, Lord, we ask that you would now, by your spirit, give us spiritual ears to hear what you have to say through your word this morning. Give us hearts to believe your word and cause your word to be at work deep within us to save those who are not saved and for us who are saved, sanctify us, that we would grow in reverence towards you, that we would grow in fear of you, which you said is the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. And God, cause us to grow in awe of you and love for you and adoration of you that you would be worshipped in our lives above all things, that with all that we have and all that we are, you would receive the honor and glory due the majesty of your name. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Savior, our coming King. Amen. Our mission is to know Christ and to make him known. In case you have forgotten, it's emblazoned above our front of our our sanctuary here. And the second half of that mission, making Christ known, involves, of course, getting the gospel to unbelievers so that they will hear of Christ and believe in Christ and be saved by Christ and know Christ. But let me ask you this. When you and I share the gospel with unbelievers, must we tell them that God is wrathful? I think that in the West, when evangelism is done, most Christians have no problem at all, and most Christians are good with proclaiming that God is love. 
that God is merciful, that God is gracious, and so on and so forth. And that is good because that is what the Word of God teaches, and that is what the prophets and apostles proclaimed. But as for the wrath of God, it seems to me, and I could be mistaken in my perception, it seems to me that most of the church in the West is not proclaiming the wrath of God. And perhaps if this is true, perhaps this is because it does not even occur to the church to do so. Or perhaps it's because the church does not want to. Or perhaps it is because the church does not think that preaching the wrath of God is beneficial. And I ask, is this good? Last Sunday, we saw that the wrath of God was a prominent feature of the preaching of the prophets, of the preaching of the Lord's apostles, and also the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Also, please observe, beginning in Romans 1, verse 18, Paul begins his most extensive written exposition of the gospel, and where does Paul start? Not with the love of God, not with the grace of God, not with the mercy of God, but where does Paul start under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He starts with the wrath of God. Paul does not neglect to mention in his presentation of the gospel the wrath of God. He does not refuse to mention it. He does not bury it, and he does not mention the wrath of God only in passing. No, he front loads his presentation of the gospel with the wrath of God. And he will keep on writing about the wrath of God from Romans 1.18 all the way to Romans 3, verse 20. And even after that, he will repeatedly still return to the wrath of God throughout much of the rest of his letter. Now, why is this the case? Well, in short, the answer is that Paul knows it's a fact. God is wrathful. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 clearly reveals this. Paul also knows that it's a fact that God's wrath is against all of humanity. Romans 1 verse 18 clearly reveals this as well. And therefore, Paul knows it's a fact that the main thing from which every single person must be saved is the wrath of God. And Paul knows that the only way of salvation is Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So this is why Paul begins his extensive presentation of the gospel with the wrath of God. Paul knows that before he tells people that there is a life-saving cure. He must tell them that they have a terminal disease. Or to change the metaphor, Paul knows that before he tells people there's a life-saving buoy, he must first tell them that they are drowning. And if we are going to tell people there's a one way for them to be saved. We had better make sure that they know in the first place that they know they need to be saved. And from what and from whom? Paul the Apostle knows the gospel of Christ is good news because he understands it in the context of the bad news. Paul knows that every single person must be saved from God's wrath. Paul knows that only God can save through Christ. And Paul knows that God saves to bring people to himself for his glory. In other words, every single person must be saved from God, by God, for God. And I tremble as I say this because the culture hates this and more and more the church hates it. And I'm thinking that all of this raises a critically important question, which is this. 
Why is God so wrathful? Why? Why is God wrathful against all of humanity? Why does all of humanity find itself in this horrific predicament wherein we need to be saved from the wrath of God? Well, the title of this sermon is Why God's Wrath is Being Revealed. And to help us move through the text that's set before us, I have three main points. The first I'm calling simply God's wrath is being revealed. We see this in verse 18. Picking it up there, look with me carefully now at what Paul writes as he's carried along by the Holy Spirit. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Through Paul, God is saying here to us this morning, his wrath, God's wrath, is being revealed. Now concerning this wrath, notice firstly how Paul begins verse 18. I keep on telling you, Paul loves to use the word for, F-O-R, and here it is yet again. And he uses it to signal to us, he's now going to give a reason for what he has just said. So what has he just said? Remember in verses 16 and 17, Paul wrote, He is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. And the gospel is the power of God for salvation, because in it, the righteousness of God, that is the saving activity of God, is revealed from faith for faith. Now in verse 18, Paul writes, For. And by saying, For, what Paul means is, this is the reason every person needs to hear and believe the gospel in which the righteousness of God is revealed. Here is why every single person needs the gospel. The wrath of God is being revealed. In other words, it's because of the wrath of God that we need the gospel, the very power of God to save us from that wrath. Now, what is the nature of this wrath of which Paul is speaking? It is obviously the wrath of God. God's wrath is his anger. And since God is righteous, his anger is never unrighteous. And since God is just, his wrath is never unjust. And since God is love, his wrath is never unloving. And since God is holy, his wrath is never unholy. And since... God is patient, his wrath is never impatient. Since God is all-knowing, his wrath is never misplaced or misinformed. Unlike our anger, which can be sinful and selfish and malicious and explosive and uncontrolled, God's anger is always sinless, good, right and controlled. And given his holiness, God's wrath is his necessary response to all that is unholy. God's wrath is his intense emotional hatred toward all that is evil. Now notice as well in verse 18 that, God, that Paul says, God's wrath is revealed. What this means is that presently, right now, even today, God is revealing, he is showing, or is he is expressing his wrath. 
Normally, we think of God's wrath as that which unbelievers who have died are experiencing in hell, or we think God's wrath is that which God will pour out on all unbelievers at the end of the age, and all of that is true biblically. However, here, Paul is saying God's wrath is also presently being made manifest. Presently. In what sense God is presently expressing his wrath, Paul does not say yet. At this point, Paul is only emphasizing the present urgency and desperate situation of all of humanity, which plainly demonstrates our current ongoing need for the gospel of God. Now, in verse 18, notice against whom God is expressing his unrighteous anger. Paul writes that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against whom? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So Paul is referring here to individuals whose lives are driven and defined by ungodliness and unrighteousness. Paul is referring to individuals who are dominated and controlled by ungodliness and unrighteousness. These individuals are enslaved to sin, Paul will later point out in Romans 6. They are living in sin, they're living for sin, they hate God, and as the overflow, they hate humanity. And as Paul explains in the last part of verse 18, by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. Because of their utter corruption and depravity, and because they love the darkness rather than the light, they are suppressing the truth. They are suppressing the truth that God has revealed to them, they're suppressing the truth that God is real and that they must answer to God. This truth that they are suppressing is like a big, strong spring that they're trying to push down, but they're doing it in vain. That truth keeps pressing up against them. Nonetheless, they keep trying to press down on the truth. They keep on trying to avoid the truth. They keep on trying to ignore the truth. They might even try to convince themselves that the truth is a lie. And they do this because their first love is sin. So who are these individuals against whom God's wrath is presently being revealed? Who are they? Which individuals are presently the objects of the wrath of God? The answer is everyone who is not presently saved. If you are outside of Christ, then the hard truth is you're one of the people Paul's talking about in verse 18. And if you are in Christ today, if you are saved, you were one of them until God saved you and placed you in Christ. There are no exceptions. And Paul will emphasize this point in the next couple of chapters of Romans. And when he get, once he gets to Romans 3 verse 9, he will say plainly, this is what God says, for we have already charged that all, all, both Jews and Greeks, all people are under sin as it is written, none is righteous, no, not even one. Romans 1 verse 18 is a description of every single human being before they were saved. Uh, that's hard to preach. 
I would much rather not preach it. Although I will preach it because God tells me to preach it. It is true, in a sense, God loves the whole world. John 3.16. The evangelical world loves to preach that. No problem preaching that. However, it is also true that every human from the moment of conception, according to chapter 1, verse 18 of Romans, is also an object of the wrath of God. The evangelical world does not like to preach this. And it will not do to say that God's wrath is only against the sin of people, not people themselves. That will not do. Writing to, the, to Christians, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, that we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of humankind. John 3, verse 36 says that as for the one who does not obey the Son, the wrath of God remains on him. Psalm 5, verse 5, we're told that God hates all evildoers. Also, it's not sin that God casts into hell, it's people who are sinners. So then in verse 18, what God is saying is that his wrath is presently being revealed against all humanity outside of Christ because of their sin. Well, let's move on to the second point, which I'm calling the truth that all humanity suppresses. And we see this in verses 19 and 20. In these two verses, Paul will now elaborate on why the wrath of God is being revealed against all humanity, and rightly so. God has been revealing some measure of truth to all of humanity, but all of humanity has been suppressing that truth. And that is why God's wrath is being revealed against all of humanity and why all of humanity deserves to be subject to the wrath of God. Look at verse 19. Paul now writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Through Paul, what God is saying is this, every single human being on planet Earth knows some truth about who God is. Let that sink in for a second. Every single person on planet Earth knows some truth about who God is. Every single person knows at least a little bit of truth about the one true living God, the God of the Bible. And that quantity of truth is limited, to be sure, but it's substantial. That quantity of truth is not hidden from anyone. On the contrary, that quantity of truth is plain to everyone. It's evident to every single person. You will never, ever meet a person who possesses zero knowledge of God. There, that person does not exist, according to this verse. And why is this the case? Well, look at the second half of verse 19. It's because God has shown it to every single human being. God has chosen to reveal some truth about himself to all people. Now, what is the truth that God has made plain to every single person? And how has God revealed this truth to everyone? In verse 20, Paul answers these questions. Picking it up in verse 20, Paul now writes, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. 
So according to this verse, what is the truth about God that God has revealed to every single human being? Answer, God has revealed his invisible attributes, but not all of his invisible attributes. God has revealed only his eternal power and his divine nature. He has not revealed to all humanity everything about who he is. He's not revealed his every attribute to all of humanity. Instead, he has revealed a very limited body of truth to every single person. He has revealed that he exists, that he is real, that he is powerful, that he is the creator, that he created us, and he deserves, therefore, to be worshipped. And how has God revealed this truth to every single person? Answer, God's creation. The entire creation reveals this body of truth to every single person on earth. God's divine nature is being revealed day after day to every single person on earth through the vastness of outer space. You look through a telescope, or you don't need a telescope, you look at the sky at night. This past week, heavens declare the glory of God to everyone. God's divine nature is being revealed through the beauty of nature through the complexity of living things. Even the most simple organism, the amoeba, single-celled organism, behold its complexity. It screams there's a creator. God's divine nature is being revealed through every storm, every lightning bolt, every peal of thunder, declares his glory. And every human being declares God is real because every human being bears the image of God. And so now, what are we to make of this? I have conversed with individuals who claim to be agnostics. They insisted that they did not know whether or not God exists. I know atheists who insist vehemently there is no God. But verses 19 and 20 tell us God has revealed to every single person through the things he has made, he does exist. So then what's going on with agnostics? What's going on with atheists? What's going on with them? Amen. End of verse 18. End of verse 18. They're suppressing the truth about God. Perhaps they've been suppressing the truth about God so long, they really have convinced themselves that either they cannot be sure God exists or that God most assuredly does not exist. They're suppressing the truth. They're either being dishonest or they are honestly deceived. I don't know how else to make sense of these verses. If you know how, let me know. To every single person, God has revealed truth to them about who he is. The problem with every single human being on planet Earth is that until we're saved, we suppress the truth about God. Because of our sin, we don't want to acknowledge the truth. We don't want to believe the truth. We don't want to live Rightly in light of the truth. Therefore, look at what God says at the end of verse 20. So they are without excuse. And what this means is that there is not a single person who can say in their defense, they didn't know God exists, and that therefore they don't deserve the wrath of God. 
There is no person who can say in their defense, I didn't know God exists, so I don't deserve God's judgment. No person can say that. Truly, every single person knows the truth about God. Creation screams it, yet, willingly, every person is guilty of having suppressed that truth. Every person is guilty of this horrendous sin. Therefore, God's judgment of every single person is just. Now, how has every person suppressed the truth about God? How does that work? This brings us, brings us to our third point, which I'm calling how all humanity suppresses the truth. And we see it in verses 21, 22, and 23. Look at 21. Paul, Paul now writes, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him. And notice, okay, you're, 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 you're really getting to know the Apostle Paul and how he writes, okay? So you, do you, you're picking up now on these fours? They're everywhere. Here's another four, beginning of verse 21. So what does that mean? Paul's now providing a reason, an explanation for what he's just written, right? What did he just write? No one's without excuse. Why is that? Well, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They're without excuse. This is why. And there's nothing anyone can say before God. There's no evidence anyone can present to God to show that he or she does not deserve the judgment of God. There's no excuse. Every single person, God has revealed that he exists to them. To every single person, God has revealed that he's real, that he's powerful, he's the creator, he created us, and he's worthy of being worshipped. Yet, every single person is guilty of not honoring and glorifying God. Every single person is guilty of not giving thanks to God the way he ought to be thanked. But that's not all humanity is guilty of. This is not the only reason God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all of humanity. Look at what Paul writes next in the middle of verse 21. Concerning all of humanity, Paul writes, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this is what happens if you by your unrighteousness, suppress the truth about God. This is what happens if you refuse to honor God, if you refuse to glorify God, if you refuse to give thanks to God. This is what happens. You become futile in your thinking. All of your reasoning processes become seriously compromised and flawed. In a sense, all of your thinking becomes worthless and useless and pointless because the truth of God has been rejected. All of your thinking becomes futile if you refuse to worship God because you have rejected true wisdom from God. You will regard the wisdom of God as folly. God will not himself be at the center of your thinking. God himself will not be served and worshipped and honored. And so your thinking is going to be all futile. Spiritually, eternally, valueless. And Paul says in verse 21 that whenever a person continues to live at enmity against God, their hearts are darkened as well. In the Bible, the heart refers to the entire inner life of a person. Not just one's emotions, but also the intellect and the will. 
In the first century, if you want to express how you felt, you, you, talk about, you would talk about how you felt it in your bowels or in the pit of your stomach. You wouldn't talk about just feeling it in your heart. If you talked about your heart in the first century, people knew what you were talking about, that they, you were talking about all of your innermost self, your emotions, your intellect, and your will, your whole being. And so the person who by their unrighteousness continues to suppress the truth about God, who keeps on refusing to honor God, give thanks to God, will find their hearts being overtaken by more and more darkness. The more you suppress the truth about God, the more your heart will be enamored with the darkness of sin and with the darkness of the evil world system and with the darkness of the evil one. And the more you suppress the truth about God, the more calloused and insensitive your heart will become over time to the truth of God. And in part, this explains what's going on with the atheist and the agnostic. They've become futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts have been darkened. They can no longer think straight. And they're lost in the dark. They're like in a dark room with no lights on. They, can't, they don't know where to go. Now, as if all of that weren't terrible enough, God has one more thing to say to us this morning about what all of humanity is guilty of doing to suppress the truth about God. Look at verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and Creeping things? Are you kidding me? Creeping things? Over God? It is stupid. Again, Paul is referring here to all of humanity outside of Christ. This is what characterizes or marks unbelievers among whom we ourselves once lived in solidarity before we were saved. The mass of unsafe humanity claims to be wise. They think they're wise and they claim to be wise. They profess to be wise because they think wisdom is rejecting the God of the Bible. They think wisdom is is opposing the truth about God that they know from creation, and they think wisdom is refusing to worship God. And yet, the exceedingly terrible irony is that they are actually fools. They're fools because they're suppressing the truth about God that God has plainly revealed to them through creation. And they're fools because they've chosen to believe lies and build their whole lives on lies. And many of them, you know, they spend years and years of their lives studying and developing lies, and they are rewarded with advanced university degrees for doing so. And they have PhDs in this stuff. And they... Brag about it, claiming to be wise. Don't believe it for a second. God says they are fools. And the summit of their folly is their idolatry. As Paul points out in verse 23, this is the pinnacle of the folly of all of unsaved humanity. They exchange the glory of a mortal God for images, for images, resembling mortal man, birds, animals, reptiles. Absolutely insane. Instead of worshiping the God of the Bible, instead of loving him, serving him, trusting him, the one who is glorious and immortal, the one who is 
indescribably majestic and beautiful and awesome, instead of worshiping that God, they worship and trust and serve idols. And throughout history, we know some have carved idols out of wood that look like human beings, and then they've bowed down to them. For real. Wasn't that Nebuchadnezzar's thing? Remember that gold statue? Others have made idols that look like birds and animals, creeping things. In 1 Samuel 5, we're told that the Philistines worshipped Dagon. Remember him? It? This Dagon was part man, part fish. Philistines seriously worship this thing. And so the Philistines, you might recall, were disturbed, to say the least, when they discovered one day in, their, in the temple of Dagon that Dagon had fallen face, face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant with his arms cut off and his head cut off. The Philistines... You know what they should have done in that moment? They should have immediately clued in that their worship of Dagon was absolutely insane and that they should fall down to the ground and utter weeping and just sorrow and utter despair and just fall on the ground like Dagon, their false god, and worship the only true living god, the god of the Hebrews. Now, we might sit here and think that, well, we're not stupid enough to do anything like this. Not stupid like the Philistines. Come on, we've developed a little bit since then. Yeah, right. The truth is that every single person is either a worshiper of the God of the Bible or a worshiper of an idol. You will never meet a person who does not worship either the God of the Bible or an idol. This is because God created every single person for worship. If you're saved, then you worship God. But if you're not saved, then you worship an idol. And if you worship an idol, what it means is that on the throne of your heart, God has been removed. And on, the th and on that throne, what you have done is you've placed something or someone else other than God. Perhaps you've placed yourself on the throne of your heart. That's just as ridiculous as what the Philistines did, worshiping Dagon. It's just as ridiculous. Or if there's an idol on the throne of your heart, perhaps it's your family. That one's easily deceiving, because family, well, that's a good thing. But do you know how many people I've met that seem to be worshiping their family instead of God? Or perhaps money is your idol, or your job, or sexual pleasure, or something else. Whatever is on the throne of your heart, it's ruling your life. You're serving it. It's your first love. You trust in it to satisfy you. Perhaps if you have an idol on, on, on the throne of your heart, you're trusting in that idol to protect you, or guide you, maybe even save you. And if you're here today by divine appointment and you are living for an idol, then I implore you on behalf of God to stop and repent. 
Stop suppressing the truth about God that God is plainly revealed through his creation. Take that idol off the throne of your heart and place God there. Bow down to God as the king and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead to save you from the wrath of God. And start honoring God. And start giving thanks to God with your entire life. And what about us who have already been saved and God is on the throne of our hearts? What about us? Well, it's Thanksgiving, is it not? What a good time. There's, it's, there's never a bad time to give thanks to God. But what an especially appropriate time to give thanks to God. Thank God that he's revealed himself to us, plainly. Not only through creation, but also through the scriptures. Thank God for convicting us of our sin. Thank God for saving us from his wrath by grace through faith in Christ. Thank God for adopting us into the household of God. I am so thankful for the church. I couldn't follow Christ faithfully apart from the church. Thank God for how he's keeping us in Christ protecting us, leading us along. I thank God for the encouragement and consolation God gives through the scriptures and by his spirit. Thank God that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank God that never will anything separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And thank God for his promise to one day return and make everything right. And thank God that one day he will complete the good work in us. He will bring us home. And home is God. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your words. Some of these truths are hard to preach. Some find it hard to believe these things are true. But God, you have spoken. Your word is true. We thank you. You have given it to us. And we ask that you will help us to understand what you are saying through your written word. Help us to believe. Help us to tremble before you as even a saved people should, working at our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it's you who's at work in us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. And, O oh God, we pray for anyone among us this morning who is not yet saved, that they would flee to Christ and trust in him, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would be able to mark it on the calendar. And for us whom you've already saved, Lord, help us to leave this place in gratitude that you have saved us and you will save us to the uttermost. And for the praise of your glory for all eternity and all of God's people say,